I hope everybody's having a wonderful day wherever you are. Um, so in today's presentation, we're going to talk about the role of home gardens in creating community ties in my home city of La Habana, Cuba. Um, a little bit of reflectivity, as I mentioned, um, I am from this area, all these gardens, I grew up walking around them. So this is a personal piece of my own home and I'm sharing it all with everybody. I hope you all enjoy it. Let me see if I can pass. So this is the chronology of what we're gonna talk about, um, just to keep a, an order, just because we are limited on time and there's a very long research project, so. So these are the driving questions that were driving my research throughout this entire process. Um, I first envisioned this as a way to understand how gardens are a source of community and how gardens are in a physical spaces where community is created, right? So the first question was, do, home, do single family home gardens in the barrios of La Habana, Cuba help create barrio societal economic and religious linkages, right? So my idea was, do gardens in and of itself facilitate interactions? As a way to narrow down the question, I pose as follow-up question, do the societal, economic, and religious interactions differ based on plant use? This was based on a research done by an Austrian academic known as Buckman, where in Trinidad in Cuba, she found that that plants were a major, plant use was, were a major factor in how interactions played out in the barrios. So I wanted to see if this is a Cuban Y phenomenon or just um, just a phenomenon in Trinidad in Cuba. Um, the concept of transculturation, which is coined by the Cuban anthropologist Fernando Ortiz in the 1940s, was one, one of the most driving components in theory in this research project. Um, Fernando Ortiz was a luminary from Cuba, and in the 1940s he conceptualized that Cuban history, Cuban society, Cuban culture, economics, it's the product of a complex process of admixture of differing social, economic, and religious practices that does not involve the complete annihilation of the previous cultures. What this means is that a Cuban person might be a Cuban, right? But the different components of his identity are not deleted in the process of becoming Cuban. In this research, I thought of Cuban gardeners as a byproduct of a long evolutionary process of differing practices in the history of Cuba that does not lose the identity of who they are as a person. So in essence, we find that a gardener, a white Cuban Catholic woman would practice Santeria, which is Afro-religious practices, in their own gardens, right? And that's a product of differing cultures mixing in Cuba, but those identities are not lost in the process of mixing. Um, a little bit of context, as I was mentioning at the beginning of the presentation, gardening in Cuba is a very historic process. It dates back to the arrival of the indigenous people to Cuba around 2000 years ago, from the northern um, South America, what is known today as the Orinoco River Valley in Venezuela. This Arawakan um, migratory events led to a very, very complex admixture, which as you already talked about, is transcultural in nature between the hunter-gatherers and archaic hunter-gatherers that led to a multi-ethnic and multilingual society known as the Taino people. The Taino people practice a very distinct form of agriculture known as conucos. These conucos were small gardens in the back of their boillos or a hut, where they would have elevated mounds that were fertile, where they will grow a variation of a lot of crops like manioc, potatoes, corn, squash, tobacco. Aside of that, we also find that conucos had a very distinct religious practices related to them. We find archeological evidence uh, where there were ritual activities that were deeply connected with the renewal process, the cosmology 
where Tainos, when Tersemis, where spiritual beings, idols, put on the ground in order for the renewal process of birth and rebirth of the earth. Um, we also find that due to the complex trade that the Tainos engaged with the Yucatan Peninsula, Florida, and South America, we find that we find a lot of introduction of crops into the island in this period. Things like sugar apples, soursop, papaya, and medicinal plants like apazote. With the incursion of the Spanish expansion into Cuba, we find that gardening in Cuba is divided into the rural gardening and the urban garden. In the rural gardening, we find that agriculture from the Tainos is as assimilated into African and Taino descendant practices in rural Cuba. With, and then with the introduction of the Spanish and the Asian, European, and African plants, they are introduced into the rural farming. As early as the 1500s, we find evidence to suggest that rural gardens in Cuba had a wide variety of plants of foreign introduction, oranges. And through the transcultural processes, we find that this gardening practice becomes incorporated into the broader Cuban society. In urban gardens, this is very different. Urban centers were aristocratic in nature. Cuban aristocratic um, elites will show opulence and power through having exotic plants in large gardens. This got to the point where royal botanical gardens were introduced into Cuba, large estates, where a large amount of biodiversity in ex exotic in nature, because they come from different areas of the world, are introduced. It comes to the point where they're so impressive that Alexander von Humboldt is invited into the Cuban botanical gardens in order to analyze the majority of the plants there. You have um, the Capugonta de Mopox, which is a, a botanical investigator sent by the Spanish king to analyze the gardens in Cuba because they have a very large amount of um, exotic plants. In the Republican Cuban, um, this is after the independence, um, before the Cuban Revolution, urban gardens continue to be the same. They're aristocratic in nature, but during this time, the influx of money in Cuba from foreign investors, you find the rise of palatial houses. These are houses that are three to four stories high, big manors with large, with large exotic gardens that in the same nature as in the colonial period are used to show opulence and power to other peoples of society. In rural Cuba during the Republican period, the corruption at the governmental level and the investment of, of American interests leads to large amount of lands being sold to corporations and plantations. So many farmers and gardeners are displaced. So we see a, a rampart at stop of gardening practices in rural Cuba. Now, when you have a lot of displaced people, it creates a lot of uncertainty and unhappiness, which leads to the revolution. The revolution, um, it's completely changes the dynamic in the social cultural dynamics in Cuba. In rural gardens, the government is appropriates all the of the of the national of the international lands owned by foreign corporations and they are redistributed back to the farmer so you see a return to conuco and gardening practice from the indigenous and african however the government starts to emphasize sustainability and self-sustaining cuba that means that there's a return to quote-unquote taino crops like yuca, potatoes, corn, squash, beans, peppers, and pumpkins, because it is a way for Cubans to, see, to, to be sustainable as Cuba didn't have money to introduce chemicals. Um, and urban gardens complete shift away from the aristocratic form of gardening. The government starts to implement programs of education for the rural farmers. They bring them to Havana and give them houses in La Habana. This is very unique to Cuba. You find this large palatial houses being given to rural farmers or quote unquote guajitos. All these gardens are completely changed for being exotic plants for ornamental purposes and they're turned into medicinal, religious and culinary gardens or quote unquote kitchen gardens. 
So you find large, this large manners completely having African and indigenous feel to them now. Um, this is very different from the previous era. This is a very, very contextual to the Cuban case. Um, and even then, these new gardens that arise from the introduction of rural farmers in the city becomes idealized spaces of revolutionary thinking. These are places where the revolution is playing itself on the hearts of the people and, the, and then the neighbors of, of La Habana. And as I said, there are examples of the revolution. So with this context out of the way, this is how I designed the research project. Uh, given the COVID-19 and all, all everything that happened during that time period, I decided that a snowball or respondent-driven sampling was the best way to get in contact with people. Given that I am from those areas, it was easier for me to contact people because I, ha I already had prior knowledge of who to talk to and who to use as an informant in the field getting information for me. Um, all the interviews were done in Spanish, participants at home, and we utilized a wide variety of formats that were available to Cuban people. Technology is not as easy as accessible in Cuba, so that was pretty much a limitation. However, given that I'm from there, I knew the specific formats to use. I divided the design into two distinct components. One was a quantitative and a qualitative component. In the, quantitative, in the quantitative component, I decided with to do a free list. This free list, I tasked the participants to enumerate the plants located in their gardens. Um, after that, I follow up with a question asking if the primary use of each individual plants. I also kept it open-ended given the nature of the Cuban people that love to talk. So I wanted to keep it as a way to make it as a dialogue rather than an inquiry. Um, in a qualitative component, a, it's still open-ended and I asked about the knowledge, where they got the knowledge from, um, where, how do they participate with the people in the gardens, the culture, meaning of this. Um, so that's some of the results I came up with. I interviewed 35 individuals. 21 of them were female, 14 were male. Um, I also did a respondent by respondent proximity analysis in order to check the variation between subgroups. Um, this uses a jacquard, uh, jacquard index, which is a way to take in consideration um, the list length and the item cited to see if there's significant difference between the information provided by one group between the other group. For gender, we find that there's no significant difference in the level of knowledge between a female and a male. Um, in a lot of cases, home gardens in many places, there's a shift between women being in control this seems not to be a case in Cuba. When we go into age group, we find that due to the fact that we're using snowball sampling, which according to Bernard, it does emphasize um, a specific age group, the elders, the people who are specialists. So as you can see, there's a primary emphasis on older generations because they are the people who know mo the most and because of that, because of that shift towards the older generation, we find that there is a significant difference in the information provided by different age groups. And the Jacker Index and the proximity analysis does not tell you which group provides the most information, but we know for a fact that there is a significant difference. In terms of uh, the barrios or neighborhoods, it is the same thing. Given that the first informants were in, El, in the most prosperous, quote unquote, in El Vedado, we find that the majority of the informants come from that neighborhood. And there's a small trailing down towards the outskirts of La Habana. And that is because the snowball sampling favors close-knit communities. Um, and we also find that there is a significant difference in the information provided by different groups. So in the free list, we, we found that a total of 390 plants were cited in the 35 interviews. This is a lot of plants. Um, and as you can see, these are some of the plants that were most mentioned 
And as you can see, you find a co complex combination of medicinal religious plants, right? None of these plants are used for um, ornamental culinary purposes. This rose a lot of questions in my mind because given the political problems in Cuba, I thought that a lot of people were gonna have culinary plants to sell and consume at home. And it turns out medicine and religion takes a primary spot in the gardens. Um, given that there were a lot of plants where the common name does not really correlate to a lot of English names, I utilized the seminal work of Roy Guimesa. Roy Guimesa is a Cuban botanist that even to this day is cited in medical texts as being the fundamental core of Cuban literature in plants. To corroborate the information provided by him, I utilized the Cuban Botanical Gardens database plants of the world in order to corroborate between the information provided by Mesa and the, and the databases of the world. As you can see from the 391 plants, the majority of the plants found were medicinal and religious. This is very, very strange because I, as, as I was mentioning, I was expecting culinary and ornamental plants to be the, at the forefront, given the political and economic situation. Additionally, given the history that we just mentioned, many of the gardens were formerly ornamental gardens of exotic plants, but the bringing of rural farmers into the city completely shift this way around and you find the rise of medicinal religious plants. Um, and likewise, I wanted to know where are these plants introduced and we find that the majority of the plants are either native or colonial, introduced during the colonial period. This is very interesting because a lot of these plants are religious and they utilize in religious ceremonies and some of them are medicinal. And a lot of people said that this is the, the plants of their ancestors, the plant of the Taino, the plant of the Africans. But as you can see, a lot of the plants are actually from the colonial period. And it's very interesting to see this dynamic. Sorry about that. So we find that parents are the main source of information and the people who are giving it to the, their kids. And you also find that schools, um, Government programs are also providing a lot of the information, same as Babala, which are Yoruba priests, religious priests, government programs, and grandparents. So I try to put some of the qualitative results in a word cloud, you know, answers to different questions in a word cloud in order to help visualize a little bit of the questions because there's a lot of questions. And there's a lot of responses. Some responses are too long, some responses are small. So these are some of the answers in a word cloud format so we can visualize it. So this word cloud asks the question for you, a home garden is a source of what? And we can see that people saw it as a source of medicine, religion, um, a source of plants, joy, um, life, um, family. So we see that there is in the qualitative side, a lot, an emphasis on well-being, medicinal religious well-being. Another question that I asked and I put in as a work cloud was, will you say that single family home guards are socially important to your community? Um, it's originally was a yes or no question, but people never give you a yes or no question. So these are the answers. So we find that for them as a source of culture, indigenous, um, African um, neighborhood ancestor um, tradition. So even then you find that gardens have become Africanized, they're indigenous in nature. And this is, uh, this to me is very contrasting to the earlier periods of gardens becoming divided between the aristocratic and the rural. And here we find that it has become one. These are some of the drawn results that I found from looking at the qualitative and the quantitative side. So we find that gardens are three distinct spaces in La Habana. One, they're physical spaces where dialogue occurs. There's a sense of privacy. Cubans think that this is a place where you can talk to your friends, where you can have conversations, where you can talk about politics, or you can talk about sports. 
it breaks the concrete monotony of living in an urban center. Cuba, La Habana is a very, it's a very urbanized city. So having gardens is a good way to break that monotony of living in a city. Gardens also facilitate a, a friendly system of reciprocity. You find that gardeners love to garden because they want to give gifts. And it's always when they are in the gardens that gifts are being solicited. So you find that a gardener will be outside planting plants and someone will come by and ask them, hey, can I have this plant for my kid? Oh, can I have this plant for um, another ritual that I want to do? And gardeners love to do this. This was part of their daily routine. And it's the fact that the gardens are there, that it acts as a physical market of sorts where different systems of reciprocity are happening. Um, I also found that gardens are spaces of deeply religious significance. So for the Afro-Cuban religions and indigenous traditions, plants hold a sacred power or they, they hold the spirits of the ancestors or orichas as they're called in the African traditions. And some plants, if you keep it in your garden, they have power in C2. That means that just because the plant is there, it provides power or different essences, right? You have la lengua vaca, which is said that if you put it in your garden, it will keep away um, evil people from talking about you, right? So I found that gardens are like a living temple of sorts, where the religious beliefs of different identities are manifested, right? As much as an Aruba practitioner might have a plant that tells you that it will protect your house, uh, a Congo, a Palo Congo, will have an altar in the garden as a way to commune with the spirits. These are some of the plants. I wanted to show a little bit of some of the plants in each category. These are some of the categories that I found were predominant, medicinal, culinary, ornamental, and religious. There were the four most different uh, categories. For instance, in medicinal plants, you have your manzanilla, which is your chamomile, your aloes, your fresh cuts, your Spanish needle. They are used in conjunction with other plants to have teas, to have infusions, to have uh, topical ointments for a wide variety of illnesses, right? And as we saw in the previous data, we find that medicinal plants are the majority of the plants being gardened. We will talk about it later, but this is very important. Culinary plants are plants that had for cooking, for eating. Um, so you find your oreganos, your onions, your cilantros, um, your green onions. It's to make adobos, sofritos, and it's for cooking. We'll talk about this later, but this is one of the least used plant, uh, cultivated plants in the gardens. Ornamental plants, as the name suggests, are plants that are just to make the garden pretty. So you have your haviscus, your palms, your um, your cactuses, your trees. Um, and religious plants are the plants used in ritual, amulet making, uh, ritual bath. And in C2, as we mentioned before, these are plants that have power and spiritual essence in them. So this is where you find your basils, your, um, your lengua vaca, your devil's weed. So they, they are probably the second most used plants in this garden. All the results, um, these are, as I mentioned, these are the things that I found from each plant use, right, to help answer the question, you know. So plants of medicinal use were mostly gifted. People did not sell them. People did not uh, exchange them. They are mostly used for gifts. And their knowledge of the cultivation and preparation is shared altruistically. Cubans had a strong sense of duty and responsibility to help each other medicinally. Sadly, Cuba has the most amount of doctors per capita. However, our hospitals and our clinics are in precarious situations, right? So there is a sense of commonality in the shared experience in living in Cuba and the medicinal problems. So there is a big emphasis in helping each other with medicinal plants. Um, culinary plants, not as, not, as, not, not as much used as other plants. Um, they were mostly sold, financial transactions, and they were not essential. They were seen as non-essential commodities that were not needed for your survival as medicinal plants. So it was mostly used in financial transactions, 
uh, and it was related to personal taste. So we find that culinary plants are not as important as medicinal plants, and they're and you can see the contrast in interactions. Ornamental plants, just as there's not as used as much, and they were you can tell that the ornamental plant still has a remnant of colonial, you know, the colonial powers and culture, you know, the show of opulence, social standing are still ingrained in the use of ornamental plants. You see a lot of people saying that they have pride in plants, in ornamental plants. You find that they want to improve the social standing by gifting orna uh, ornamental plants, you know, to doctors, to members of the party, to teachers, in order to incur special treatment. Um, like medicinal plants, these are shared um, openly, their knowledge of the cultivation, they're gifted. However, they're done for not the same reasons, right? They're done for power and pride and social standing. Religious plants, that's when you go back to the same as medicinal plants. They are used, the primary prescriptor of the use of religious plants are Yoruba priests, or as we call it, Babalaos. The Babalaos are religious priests that they prescribe the use of the plant, that they tell you the stories of each individual plants. Um, to misuse the plant, to mistreat it, and incur spiritual and social repercussions. The plants are literally the embodiment of the orichas, which are ancestral spirits. So to misuse them, to give them away as a gift, as money for money for monetary transaction, is bad. It's seen as not okay because these plants are religious in nature. So a lot of people had an altruism in them. Of course they didn't want to incur religious repercussions, but there was a strong sense of altruism because by giving plants away and gifting them and having them in a garden, they were able to not only help their own spirituality, were able to help other people express their spirituality. So my conclusion is, can we say that single family home gardens in the Valles of La Habana help create societal and cultural linkages? We cannot say for certain because the sample size is not representative of the entire population. However, we can say that there's a pattern and there is a social phenomena that arises from here. So we can say that, yeah, these are physical spaces where cultural, where transcultural society is, is expressed, where economics, uh, religious practices are often at play. Um, these are places that go beyond biodiversity and these have become social spaces where interactions are often occurring. They are a storeroom of traditional knowledge and it helps people not only connect with other people in the Vajris, but connect with their ancestors. Likewise, can we say that the cultural and societal interactions differ based on plant type? I, for this one, I will say that, yeah, we have a strong evidence to suggest that plant use molds societal interactions um, these plants, be it medicinal, culinary, ornamental, are the ones that determine the interaction between gardens and non gardeners As we see, medicinal plants are gifted and the interactions are around altruism, helping people. Culinary plants are the opposite. They're monetary in nature. It's not essential. It's, you know, capitalistic, which is very different from what the government is trying to incur upon its people. So, thank you. I mean, it, this is just a summary of everything I did. There's more nuances included, but I wanted to at least go give a broad overview of what I did and see if anybody, anybody has some questions. So I wanted to keep it small so we can have a more of a discussion.